recorded. There you go. Do you see a red dot now? Now yes. I see it. Yep. Yes. Up here in the cloud, a red dot mm -hmm. in the cloud. We do. A red see dot okay. over there. Yeah. Okay. Oh my goodness, we do have. Oops, turn yourself off, Bruce. All right, Bruce, you're going to need to mute yourself. All right, good. Okay, um, I guess we can start. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of July 31st, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.38 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colton. I'm here. Jesse Major. I am present. Karen Winter. Here. And I, Doug Marshall, am present. Members Janet McGowan, Johanna Newman, and Fred Hartwell are absent this evening. We do have four members present, which constitutes a quorum for this meeting. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item on the agenda is reserved for public comment regarding items not otherwise listed on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so the time is now 6.42, and we will go right into uh, the first item on the agenda, which is approval of minutes of our past meetings. I believe we have two sets of minutes uh, ready for approval tonight, uh, both from the month of May, um, our meeting on May 1st, and our meeting on May 15th. We'll deal with the May 1st minutes first. Did anyone have any comments on the minutes uh, or corrections? I'm seeing two out of three other members shake their heads no, and I don't have any. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, Bruce, go ahead. I'll move the adoption of the minutes of the, the date uh, nominated uh, so uh, as submitted. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jesse. I'll second that. All right, thank you. 
any further com conversation about the May 1st minutes before we vote? I will assume Bruce and Jesse, your hands are legacy hands at this point. All right, in that case, we'll go right into a uh, roll call vote for the May 1st minutes to approve the minutes. Uh, Bruce? I, I approve. All right, thank you. Jesse? I approve. Karen? I approve. And I approve as well. So that's four in favor, three members absent. The motion passes, the May 1st minutes are approved. All right, we'll go right to the May 15th minutes. Any comments about those minutes? All right, oh, I saw three out of three other members say shake their heads no. Jesse, you, you got there first. I move to approve the May 15th minutes. All right, and Karen. I second. Thank you both. <laughs> Any further comments? All right, we'll re go right into that, uh, going in reverse order. Karen. I approve. Thank you. Jesse. I approve. And Bruce. I approve as well, yes. Thank you, and I approve also. That's again, four in favor, three absences and the motion passes. All right, we will now go to the second item on our agenda, which is public comment. Um, at this time, I customarily read the names of the public members who are on the Zoom call. And uh, tonight, there is a large number of viewers. Um, so if you are a member of the public and you would like to make a comment on something not on later on the agenda tonight. So this is not the time for public comment about the library project, for instance. So uh, this is about something other than the library. Uh, and we will come back for public comment when we get to that uh, topic on the agenda. All right, so reading the 41 names that I see on Zoom. Uh, Arlie, Austin Surratt, Carol Pope, Christopher Benfrey, Deb J Jacobson, Eugene Gofredo, Farah Amin, Ginny H, Helena Donovan, Hilda Greenbaum, James with WAMC, Janet Keller, Jeff Lee, Jenny Kalick, Jess Schondorf, Josephine Penta, Judy Bailey, Ken Rosenthal, Kent Farber, Kitty, Leticia LaFollette, La Laura Drauker, Lee Edwards, Lou Conover, Maria Kopicki, Martha Hanner, Maura Keen, Miriam Sierra, Neil Immerman, Pamela Rooney, Rachel Loeffler, Rebecca Nordstrom, Richard Carpenter, Robert Bazooka, Roman Handlin, Sean Burke, Shalini Bal Milne, Sharon Sherry, Steve Nelson, Susan Landau, Tamson Ely, Tony Cunningham, and Tony Shaw. And I apologize to anybody who uh, whose name I uh, mispronounced. And I know that a number of those people were with the design team of the for the library project, and uh, we will hear from them later. Okay, so as I said earlier, this is the time for public comment about items not appearing later on the agenda. Uh, and uh, I saw a few hands before I said that and they disappeared. Uh, at this time, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so I'll uh, give you a few more seconds to realize that your topic is not related to the library um, and raise your hand before we move on. Okay, there are no raised hands at this time, so I will conclude that there is no public comment about items that are not appearing later on tonight's agenda. So the time now is 
we will go on to the third item on the agenda, the one I guess you are all waiting for, um, the uh, site plan review uh, related to the resubmission of the site plan materials for the Jones Library. So in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. It is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2025-01, the Jones Library at 43 Amity Street and 68 North Pleasant Street. Request site plan review approval under section 3.334 of the zoning bylaw regarding a not-for-profit library or museum to amend previously approved site plan review approval SPR 2024-02 by approving updated site and building plans based upon value engineering after initial bidding. The parcel or the property is located at parcel 14A-36 and 14A-41 and 14A-94 in the BG zoning district. Any board member disclosure for tonight's topic? Okay, I see no uh, hands raised for disclosure. All right, so at this time, uh, maybe it's you, Nate, that uh, will bring in the presenters from the applicant. Um, yeah, if you're here to present on behalf of the library, you can raise your hand. All right. You'll be asked to uh, join as a panelist, and then I guess your screen will go blank for a second if you accept it, but don't worry, you'll re-enter. I think I saw seven hands raised. I think I have, I think everyone has been. Um, I'm seeing still, well, I see Josephine Penta. Um, is Susan Landau part of the design team? Not if anyone, if Austin or anyone wants to answer that or Sharon, I, I, they had their hand raised earlier and then raised it before we had asked for it. So I think it might. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So members of the public, we are going to get the presentation from the present from the applicant and we will have some board discussion before we get to, to public comment. Uh, rest assured, we will have a time for public comment on this topic. Okay, um, so welcome uh, again to the design team and uh, the members of the library committee. Um, maybe Austin, I'll ask you. Uh, Thanks, Doug. Uh, who is going to lead off and uh, welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'm going to lead off. Um, my name is Austin Serrett. I serve, among other things, as chair of the Jones Library Building Committee. Uh, we're joined by members of the design team, people have worked on the landscape design, and uh, people have done the architectural work for the building. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present again to the uh, planning board. Uh, I want to be clear that I understand actually what it is that we are doing. The notice for this uh, meeting uh, rightly referred to uh, a revised or changed plan. So what we intend to do tonight is to review the changes that have been made since the last time we were before you. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing again from stem to stern. We're going to focus on uh, the changes. There are two primary areas where we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about changes in the landscaping and changes uh, largely a few changes to the exterior of the of the building. Uh, if that is incorrect, if that's not the focus of what it is that 
we are we are doing please correct me now because that's what our presentation has been based on uh austin i think that is accurate um um you know the board i i i think uh we do want to focus on what the changes are right um i will say um uh, to the members of the public, uh, this is a site plan review, and uh, the planning board it typic is is typically not able to actually reject a site plan. Mm -hmm. um, we make suggestions. We can draw out the process. Um, we can encourage things to be changed, but we, in the end, we really can't reject it outright. Um, we received a lot of letters about this project in the last few days, uh, more than we typically receive. Uh, although many were in favor of and very supportive of the project, there were a number that were uh, in opposition to it and hoped we would not approve the project. Uh, and so to those people, I guess that's what uh, I'm addressing these comments, and that is we really can't say no. Um, uh, under state law. So with that, uh, Austin, why don't you tell us about the changes to the site plan and the building exterior since we last uh, approved your plans? Great. I'm just going to say a couple of uh, quick things. Um, as, as you all know, the library has gone through uh, what is called a value engineering uh, process. Uh, we've gone through the value engineering process to try to reduce uh, what would be the bidding cost of the project. In going through the value engineering process, uh, the building committee for the library was very concerned that we make no changes that would affect the essential integrity of the project. And we believe that we have done that. Uh, some changes have had to be made uh, to things that we might have thought was desirable, but things that are needed remain. And the integrity of the project has been preserved, as I think you will see tonight. So I'm going to actually now turn it over to Tony from FAA, uh, who will begin the process of uh, leading us through the changes that we, uh, we want to show you. Th thanks again, Tony. Thanks, Austin. And this will be a shared presentation with Rachel from uh, the landscape architecture firm. So I'm going to attempt to share a screen and tell me if you can see it. Can yes, everyone can. see this? Yes, we can, Tony. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go through in response to what we are charged with presenting tonight, what the VE items are. So I actually am going to have Rachel begin in terms of the site overview, and then the next series of image will go into both the architecture impacts and the landscape impacts at sort of the high level. So Rachel, um, if you want to start at this slide, sure. uh, please do so. Thanks, Tony, and thanks, Austin. Um, yeah, we're pleased to share with you um, the changes that we've made as part of the value engineering process. Um, as we think about value engineering on this project, we were trying to identify areas that could be sort of removed and deferred to later as funds allow for the landscape um, so that our decisions would not prohibit those from being added in the future. And then the second category of things that we were looking at are things with big ticket items, things that could have really getting into those big numbers and seeing if there's something that we could simplify or redesign um, to achieve a, a lower cost. So what Tony and I are going to walk you through are the views um, and how they're affected. This is a map showing from the site point of view what's changed. Um, we're deferring the children's courtyard. Uh, we've been able to redesign the stormwater system to eliminate the subsurface system in the front, um, which then has uh, implications in the back, which I'll talk you through later when we get into the slides. Um, and we've um, made some slight modifications to the rain garden area above grade and below grade. Um, and we also um, were able to simplify some of the utilities in the fire department or parking lot. Okay. okay, Tony, ready for the slides? 
So I'm going to start first with what the architecture issues are, and then Rachel can comment on the site. So in the way that we've shown this, the lower right here was the original design, and then the upper left is the revised design. And I will make one very quick caveat. The tree that's actually existing here is really this. It is not limbed up like this. We did this for the purpose of the rendering, but this is the reality of what you, you see. So the, the main things I'm going to point out are as follows. With respect to the roof, uh, we have consideration for a potential alternate to the synthetic slate that was proposed to replace with asphalt shingles on the existing building, which you can see I'm sort of highlighting here. That's number one. This is an alternate change that is being explored. Number two is an alternate to also omit the replacement sashes on the existing windows and therefore leave the windows intact, as opposed to the original design was to replace the windows uh, with new windows in, in here. And then the third element, which is though not visible in this view, we're going to talk briefly about is the removal of a skylight clear story element, which we're going to see in another view momentarily here that has been taken out. Those are the major elements on the architecture side. And then Rachel, if there's anything here you want to talk about on the landscape from this view, please do so. Sure, yeah. I, I think one of the things that this view helps illustrate is that though we are removing the children's courtyard area and um, making some other changes to the landscape, the overall aesthetic and um, feeling of the front of the landscape is intact. Um, so in the children's courtyard area, uh, we remove the, the patio area and, and furnishings and fencing, um, and we're replacing that with grass. And we still have an accessible, we still have an emergency egress out the children's door. Um, we've also deferred or eliminated the um, Goshen stone benches that are flanking um, the main facade of the building here. Um, and those could be added at a later date. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there used in an original design, we had um, split the stormwater storage with the front and the back, and we had a subsurface system, which is a, just a giant pipe underground in that front lawn area. And we've been able to eliminate that. Um, and I'll talk through what we did in the back to accommodate that. So those are the site, those are the landscape changes that happened in the front. And I will say that um, with the removal of the benches in the front, uh, we we are making some slight tweaks to the lighting, which is still in process um, to adjust to those changes. Coming back to the architecture side, um, what uh, we're looking at here is you can now just barely see in this view right here. This is where the original light clear story monitor was located. And that has now been removed, which you can see no longer here. The only other thing, commentary on the exterior, which is not really impactful, is that there was some trim detail around these upper window areas here. Part of the VE, those trim elements have been removed. So essentially, the upper lower windows are detailed in the same way. Rachel? Yeah. Um, so in the, in the back garden, um, again, this view kind of helps illustrate that the overall <laughs> design intent and feel is preserved with the value engineering items. Um, what we've done was we, we have from a, you know, before we had one large basin that uh, two walkways crossed with a bridge. And what we've been able to do in the back is to turn those into three separate smaller basins with at grade walkways passing by. So that simplification uh, saved money with the bridges, the abutments. Um, and then in addition, we have been able to expand the subsurface stormwater structure uh, to accommodate the um, removal of the subsurface stormwater structure in the back. So these, these adjustments in grading and structure allocation um, help simplify the stormwater design and, and help provide cost savings. Um, additionally, in this area, you can see we've removed the Goshen stone bench from the edge of the patio area, something that could be added later. 
Um, and we've removed some of the patio furnishings as well as a veneer on, on the wall, the, the retaining wall. Um, that's it for that for that area. And then uh, on this other view at the angle, again, from an architecture standpoint, uh, we're showing here that this clear story element here previously has now been removed. And again, the window detail around these openings on the upper level have been simplified to allow these windows and these windows to be detailed the same. Um, and Tony, I, I, I forgot to mention on the previous side, if you, the slide, if you could go back to that. Um, we did make some modifications to the planting in the in the rain garden at the back. So we're preserving the shade trees um, as before. That, but we, we've been able to do is um, we had a, a mix of sedums and perennials and low vegetation that flowered um, and provided pollinator habitat. But, um, but what we've done is we replaced it with a no-mo grass mix. Um, and that that's something that could remain. It could be mowed or it could be replaced with uh, future planting in the future. Um, and on the next side, there there you know there aren't any additional landscape items to talk about. On summation, as a repeat of what we just presented on the architecture of the items uh, being looked at, the alternate is to change the synthetic slate shingles to asphalt shingles on the existing library to an alternate to admit the replacement sashes of the existing windows as opposed to replacing those windows. And then we are removing the roof monitor from the new construction. Again, Rachel, if you want to restate these six bullet points, some bullet points again on the landscape side. Sure, yeah. Um, so we are deferring the Goshen stone benches at both the front and the rear of the library. Um, we're deferring the children's courtyard area. Um, we're deferring the stormwater garden planting, but we are using a NOMO seed mix to keep it stable and functional. We've re reconfigured the rain garden bridge crossings, um, eliminating them and, and having solid sidewalks instead. We've reduced the paving extent and utility work within the fire department parking area. So this is an area um, where we will be providing new sewer lines and new drainage lines to support the library and paving that area of trenching above. Um, we've eliminated the front subsurface stormwater system. Um, and we are, there's also some piping and structures that are eliminated with that as well. And then um, we're eliminating the granite cladding that's at the retaining wall of the historical a society boundary and replacing with the color admix or it's an area that could um, be painted as a mural um, by someone in the community. So we think that brings up uh, essentially the presentation for tonight. We do have supplemental detailed materials behind all of this, but we really wanted to get at the heart of the matter. And these are the items that uh, are affected by the VE um, proposal. So now we just open up to questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Rachel. I see that Chris has her hand up. Maybe she wants to make uh, some comments before we get into the discussion. Yeah, I wanted to note that the Design Review Board did review this a couple of weeks ago, and um, they made recommendations. I think we emailed them to you, but I'm not sure that they got into the packet, um, and the recommendations were written up by Pat Auth, who's a member of the Design Review Board, and their recommendations were to keep the synthetic slate shingles on the existing building, to replace the existing windows on the existing building because they felt that those were more um, energy efficient and would require less maintenance in the long run, and they were willing to um, go along with the changes that were made to the landscaping. So the change that required the removal of the children's patio and the changes that were made to the um, rear planting area, uh, they were okay with those. They realized that those were necessary for the cost savings. So I just wanted to report that to you. Thank you. And the other thing is that the Historical Commission will be looking at this, I think, on August 22nd, but Nate might be able to tell you more about that. 
Thank you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, Tony, I guess a, a first question in response to what Chris said uh, is the reason that you are uh, characterizing the synthetic slate and asphalt shingle alternate uh, or change and the uh, sash replacement change as alternates uh, in part to respond to the historical or to the design review commission? We have a, you know, as, as you know, Doug, we're going through a value engineering exercise. There are certain costs associated with the roof and the windows. So the library is very carefully considering those alternates to replace the synthetic slate that originally proposed and to keep the windows essentially that are there intact as part of a cost saving measure. So that is that is what's driving that discussion with respect to the building. I, I guess maybe um, maybe I'm a little bit confused. Are those two items expected to be bid alternates, deduct alternates? Yes. Okay. So the base the base bids will include the synthetic slate. They will include the replacement sashes. That's correct. And then the there will be a separate number of the credit available if the library decides to downgrade the project. Correct. OK. All right, so board members, we'll have some discussion first, and then we will open up to the public, and then we will come back to the board. So any initial comments or questions that the board members are burning to ask, this is the time to get them out uh, early in the process. Bruce, you, you're up first. Uh, yes, I've got four uh, questions, I guess. The first is, it's a little esoteric, but I'm curious. Uh, have you decided the alternate, the order of the alternate, of those two alternates yet? Would the roof slate be the first or the second, or have you not yet decided? Tony? I think we have not, but I think we're looking at both um, simultaneously. So as part of the costing exercise, both are going to be considered. But with respect to one over the other, I think it will really come down to what we're seeing the value proposition is. But don't you have to take them in order listed? You want or you even a different bid uh, uh, climate than uh, public bidding? Just think you want to respond yeah, to that that's correct um we do have, you, they do have to take them in order um and we haven't decided yet what the order would will be okay um second question uh i too have uh, followed this project uh, particularly the uh, synthetic slate or the the slate substitution discussion and uh i wasn't exactly sure where the uh the, the substitutions were where the synthetic slates were being proposed and i uh but i do think it's on the it would include the top uh, plane of the uh, south-facing roof uh, of the library. Is that correct? Between the two big chimneys there? It is correct. Yes. Um, uh, my deep concern about this is that um, any surface that is likely uh, uh, or intelligently a recipient of uh, solar panels, um, it's really quite imperative that the... Uh, the life of the substrate, the life of the roofing material that's under the solar panels, we have at least the life of the panels themselves. And this synthetic slate material, I think, does. I have this stuff on my house. It's been on there for over 20 years, and it shows no sign of change from the day. I know a number of other projects of mine and others over a 30-year period that have used this stuff, and it does seem to have uh, the promised 50-year-plus life. So it seems to be a good candidate for roofing material under PV panels, which also have a, you know, say about a 50 year cycle. So putting uh, uh, asphalt shingles on that roof, if you were ever intended to put PV panels on it, or if you denied the opportunity of putting PV panels on it because you put uh, a short life material like asphalt shingles would seem to be a mistake. So I'm uh, strongly uh, uh, inclined to support the design review boards uh, recommendation that uh, 
that the library do all it can to preserve the synthetic, uh, the, the superior uh, durability of the uh, proposed synthetic slate on that roof. Um, I don't need an answer to that. Um, I just want to make that uh, clear yet again. I've made it clear in letters to various people, um, and I have the opportunity to do it again publicly. I commend that to you. Uh, second and third are questions. Um, the, um, it seems that you've been very thoughtful about the drainage system and how you can uh, uh, redesign that in a way that saves uh, a considerable uh, uh, amount of money. And uh, when I read through the, the documentation in prior to this meeting, I thought, well, why wasn't this done that way originally? Was it that it was just thought of, or was it that it wasn't quite as good as the system that was originally designed, or is there another reason? I just want to be sure, or as sure as we can, and, and have you explain uh, to us publicly, that the the system, the 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 the, the change in the in the uh, drainage system that you've uh, are now intending to implement is certain is 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 certainly adequate and 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 uh, has it is it a less adequate system for the uh, less amount of dollars spent on it um, than what you initially designed I, I I think we should be sure that uh, what you're doing here is uh, is fully prudent and if you could respond to that I'd appreciate it then I've got one more question Doug would you make to first, uh, or let me proceed depending on how you like, but I, I would like to talk about, the, I'd like you to tell me about the drainage system. Rachel. Sure, um, Bruce, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I would, uh, I guess I'll start with, um, we were looking at a increase in pervious surface on, on the Jones Library of Property site. Um, and we try, oh, you, do you need me to speak up? Um, You're good. You, I think we can hear you. Okay. Um, we are, we are looking at an increase of impervious surface on the Jones Library site, both through paving and through additional roof area. Um, so when we looked at the site, we thought it would be better to split the drainage. So roof leaders on the front of the library to collect those in a system immediately out front and then roof leaders um, and surface flow out back into the rain garden. Um, that was a common sense approach. Um, there is a complicating factor in the front that we have an electrical line duct bank pretty sizable that we have to drop under with the subsurface uh, storage system outfall to get um, out to the outlet. So that created a bit of challenge with our flows. Um, Greg in our office has prepared a stormwater model and report for both scenarios, the original submission and this revised submission. Um, and he actually spent quite a bit of time tweaking things, ch changing the grading slightly, changing the structures, changing um, pipe sizes and things to get things to balance. But um, to let you know, we are balanced for um, pre and post flows. To give you numbers, uh, in the existing site releases 7.19 CFS in a 100-year storm. And we've actually reduced that outflow with this revised system down to 6.37 CFS. So it's an improvement over an existing condition. Um, and it's purely in the regrading. We have larger basins. We have three basins that are slightly larger in footprint than that original one. And it's adding a row of subsurface uh, system to that to to that exist to that big big Lego block system in the back, and then it's the fact that we're not having to jump over hurdles to avoid the really deep line with the to miss the electric duct bank. So I hope I hope that answers your question. It it, it does. Thank you. Go ahead, Bruce. Bruce, so, one other one other clarification for you. There was actually never intention to do PVs on the historic building roof. It, would, it was going to go on the new part. Just point of clarification. Yes, uh, that may be the answer for now, but I can see that it might not apply for the next 50 years. So it's such a perfect roof up there that 
it's it's I understand your answer, Tony. I just want to be clear that it's uh, uh, we typically don't. Uh, I mean, I would like to see that uh, durable material on that roof uh, for that reason, but also for others. Um, none, nonetheless, uh, Doug, should I proceed with my number next question? Sure, or go you... ahead, Bruce, and then okay. we'll go to Karen. Um, I think this is for Rachel. Rachel, uh, the first uh, uh, iteration of this, um, I was really kind of enchanted by the uh, landscape uh, plantings that you had uh, proposed, um, and particularly because there used to be quite a nice garden around the back of this library, and and that won't uh, that that is gone. And I thought, well, the plantings that you were proposing seem to be quite rich. Um, I mean, flowers and so forth. I mean, you had a whole sheet of drawings showing all of the different types of plants and and it was intricate and wonderful and 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 uh, it felt like it would be very nice back there at various times of the year. Uh, can you tell me whether what you had proposed uh, a, a couple of months ago in the way of plantings is uh, is being retained or is that uh, should that also be listed as a change? The, to clarify, the um, I just want to clarify, planting as a whole in the front is um, the same as what was prepared before. And this rain garden area where you're talking, um, the the aesthetic, like the loose quality of it is similar. We retain the stepping stones, the Goshen stone stepping stones through the basins. We retain the boulders and the reclaimed granite seat walls. Um, the Nomo mix is about 18 inches tall and it flops over. So it looks like little waves in the landscape. Um, it's something that can be mowed. It just needs to be mowed at a little bit of a higher height, no less than four inches. Um, and it's something that can be supplemented over time. So we've seen um, some places uh, plant minor bulbs like crocus um, and fritilla lily into the, into the matrix. Um, it's something too that over time, as interest and funds allow, we could start to add in that original design palette um, and add to it over time. The Nomo mix is not like a traditional lawn. Um, it's something that you can really work with. So it's something that we were looking at that could stabilize the, the rain garden area, and, and but also kind of have that looser quality to it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. All right. Thank you, Bruce. All right, Karen. Um, yeah, thank you. I since I'm on the design review uh board, you, you know that we all unanimously uh said that we would not approve the the asphalt shingles uh for, for many reasons, durability, but also aesthetics. It, it's such a history. I mean, it's the front, it's it's a roof that's very visible, but I don't want to go into that. I'm wondering, since you know we keep hearing that this is going to be a net zero building, and uh, one reason to build is just because the future demands that we save energy. What the windows that that now are not going to be replaced? Are you still going to be able to achieve this kind of um, net zero and and uh, energy savings if if you use these old windows that are just repaired as needed. I'm I'm open to hearing, I mean, I've heard, I, I was very strongly against uh, not changing the windows, but then I've, I've heard from neighbors that in some cases, the old windows seen with storm windows are sometimes better than some of the new replacement windows. And if you don't have the money for good replacement windows, then maybe it's okay. But how have you examined this? I mean, this is a cost saving measure, but what does this do to the overall energy picture of this building? All right, Tony. Can yeah, Josephine respond to this? Um... Okay. Sure, yeah, I can respond. Um, so we, um, this is a net zero ready building, not a net zero building. Jo ready. Josephine, you are difficult to hear. Oh. This happens a lot. Can you hear me? Can you hear me better now? A yeah. little bit. Um, so I'll try and speak a little bit louder <laughs> so everybody can hear me. Um, this is not a net zero building. 
but we um, are looking at all sustainability measures that we can um, at the time. Um, we are doing that this whole summer, you know, analyzing um, all sorts of different sustainability um, approaches to, um, to, to everything. Um, the historic portion is exempt from the new energy codes, um, but that doesn't mean that we won't be looking at um, how we can, you know, make this building better. Um, as far as um, the EUI, that will that is considered the existing building is considered in part of that calculation, and we will be running those reports um, this summer as well. So we will be doing all of our typical um, studies that we do as we make these changes. So right now, you you have no idea what the what difference the windows replacing windows will do energy wise to the cost of maintaining the library. No, not to the cost of maintaining the library, we do not. Because drafty windows means a lot more energy is used. Uh, are you still including the storm windows on the windows? In, in which approach to, sorry about that. In the uh, value engineered approach. So in the value engineered approach, it would just remain as it is. We won't as is without any, any new layer of, of thermal separation. Okay, all right. Um, I guess I don't see other board member uh, hands raised. Uh, Jesse, let me know if you have some questions. I guess my, my main question for the team is uh, in the uh, local news, uh, we heard that the project came in uh, roughly $7 million over, over the budget when the bids, when it was bid earlier this year and that you were embarking on a significant value engineering effort. Um, is, are you hoping that these changes as described will total 7 million in, uh, in value? I guess when I hear what you've done, I'm not sure I think you're even gonna be close to 7 million. So I just, Doug, thank you for that question. Uh, the value engineering, uh, issue is a, it's a budget issue. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a planning board board issue. So whether or not we have seven million dollars worth of changes or not, I, I'm just I, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm not sure how it's relevant to the site plan uh, review process. I would say the following: if you if you followed what we said at the, in the building committee, we're trying to reduce the costs uh, of the original bid in a couple of ways. Value engineering was only one part of that plan. Okay. All right. Um, Austin, I don't disagree with you that it is not uh, part of the site plan review. Uh, however, I, I suspect that it is a topic that is on people's minds. So and, and I respect that. That's why that's why we've discussed it publicly in the Jones Library Building Committee several times. Uh, okay. So it, this is not, it's not hidden. It's been out there in the, it's not out there in the public. Uh, we're, we're really happy to answer questions. The, our hope tonight was to keep us focused on what, what you all need to, you all need to determine. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, uh, uh, if we're going to talk about things like price and costs and how much we're saving, that that's what the building committee has been has been doing. OK, all right. I will uh, have to look up those recordings of those meetings and find out what you said. All right, uh, Nate. Sure. I mean, Doug, I don't think it's completely irrelevant because, you know, if the planning board finds that the loss of some of these features, whether it's the children's courtyard or some of the plantings, you know, detracts from the site plan, and they say, and you say, no, you know, how does the product move forward? And so I think it's a question, 
you know, I think it should be guided first, you know, are these changes, um, you know, appropriate or, you know, adequate for the planning board? And if not, why not? And then that becomes part of the conversation. I don't, I wouldn't be, let it be, you know, I wouldn't have the monetary discussion or energy efficiency be the leading reason why there's decisions being made. But I think, you know, if the planning board starts to have a discussion, then I think it can be relevant, uh, but not, you know, the major reason why you're talking about something. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So why don't we turn to public comment at this time? Um, and Josephine, I'll let you speak while members of the public, if you want to make a comment about this project, uh, please start raising your hand. Go ahead, sure. Josephine. Sure. Thanks, Doug. I just wanted, I wasn't sure in the beginning of my comments that any, everybody heard me because, um, because of what you had said. Um, but I just wanted to make a point that this is not a net zero building. Um, I don't know if everybody heard that previously. So just wanted to, to make sure say that again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. thank you. All right, um, so I see so far eight hands raised uh, from public members. Why don't we start with Pam Rooney? Nate, can, if you can bring her over. Sure, Alva, do you want me to have a timer, Doug, on my phone? I don't have the screen that Pam usually had. Uh, sure, that would be helpful. I'll, we, I'll keep we, sort of informal time on my watch as well. And do we bring them over as panelists or just allow them to talk? I forget what's, how do you want to proceed? Uh, well, they customarily show up in the uh, panelist screen. Sure. Uh, Pam, I'll promote you to panelists and then you can speak. And just our uh, Tony, maybe you could stop sharing so that we can see each other better. I don't see Pam. I was, um... All right, Pam, you can unmute yourself. You should be able to speak. Yeah. Pam, you are muted. Pam, you are still muted. There you Thank go. Thank you. I think you don't want to bring people in as panelists because yeah. it takes 20 seconds to to, uh, to load up. Um, I had a question about the curtain wall. There was a good image of it as we were leaving that, uh, the image that was on the screen when um, you called on me. And I have never been clear if the curtain wall is still in the project or if that will be replaced with storefront windows on that north facade. I wonder if somebody could uh, address that, please. Oh, Pam right. Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. And did you have additional comments you wanted to make? No, that was, that was the question that I wanted to ask. Okay, all right. And I think so, that because, because that is within the purview of the planning board, I think it's a physical attribute of the building. Thank you. Yes, yes. All right, Tony, uh, you able to answer that? Uh, Doug, I just have a procedural question. I, I wanted to make sure I understood. I thought at the beginning you said we were not going to be answering these questions. Uh, we're not going to be going back and forth. Um, no, my, my earlier comment regarded comments made during the general public comment Th period. Thank you. Thank you. Not during this specific topic. Tony? Question about the curtain wall. We are replacing, I'm going to have Josephine again respond in detail. Sure. So the the curtain wall will be at the um, rear entry, um, that vertical piece at the rear entry um, that remains curtain wall. Um, and all of the other windows are punched tra traditional windows. That was changed. And that was changed since the original submission? Yes, that was part of the VE process. Okay. All right, so I hope, Pam, that that was an adequate response. Answered your question. All right, okay, Nate. Well, I, uh, I, if I could follow up, I um, I thought that was one of the cost-saving measures was to change from curtain wall to storefront. So it sounds as though it has been determined that is it is not a cost-saving measure. 
No, we did change the, the it was all curtain wall previously and now all the punched openings are uh, traditional windows. And the curtain wall only remains at the north entry um, vertical piece. Yeah, so it sounds like there were significant uh, reduction in the amount of curtain wall uh, and it's only remaining at the north entry. That's correct. Okay. All right, Nate, uh, why don't we move Pam back? And um, if there's a more efficient way to let people go through this, uh, I'll leave it to you to implement that. Sure, yeah, we'll leave everyone as attendees and then you'll just be asked to unmute yourself or you'll have that ability. And so that'll be okay. Little, yeah. All right, it looks like Neil Immerman is next. Hello, Neil. So, he hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm, I'm Neil Emmerman. I live at 37 Hillcrest Place. And I just wanted to make a, a brief comment. I, I know everyone's been a little frustrated that the, the one bid that came in was much too high and we have to go back and look at this again. I appreciate I appreciate what you're doing and I, I don't have a strong feeling for the for the details of, of the new plan. I just I just hope it can can all come together and everyone can agree and you can go out for a bid and and do this project. You know, it's just something I just want to just restate my strong belief that that we need this project to happen. And I hope I appreciate you all working together on the details and I hope we can get it all done. So that was all. Thank you, thank you very much for your work. All right. Thank you, Neil. All right. Uh, next, we have Jeff Lee. Hello, Jeff. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jeff Lee from South Amherst. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm troubled by the loss of sustainability features uh, with the value engineering changes. Um, Amherst's commitment to sustainability is demonstrated by the fact that we have a net zero bylaw for public buildings, yet the library project is going in the opposite direction. Um, we're losing uh, multiple pa uh, double pane glass on the windows. We're losing uh, the slate roof, replacing it with asphalt. We're losing the light monitor, which lets in natural light, much like the uh, atrium today lets in uh, natural light. We're losing all that. Um, and we're losing uh, cross laminated timber, which was an important uh, sustainability feature. Um, to win funding from the town council, the uh, library project people made all kinds of claims about how sustainable this project would be, yet um, we've lost all those features. Um, Austin Sarad himself once said this is uh, one of the most sustainable, if not the most sustainable building in Amherst. That's no longer the case. And I think we need to know what the measurements are. What's the energy use intensity? What are the Teddy numbers? What's the uh, life cycle assessment measurement, you know, regarding uh, with regard to embodied carbon that we've lost by eliminating the cross laminated timber. So I think we're ahead of the game in trying to permit this project without knowing, knowing those things. Thank you. All right. Excuse me. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I just got a call from Pam Rooney and she asks that you remove her from the panelist. If you can do that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying. I've changed her twice now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she disappeared. And it's possible that she hung up and will come back. Nope, she's still here. All right. And uh, it sounded like Jeff Lee was finished. So we can uh, take him off. And the next person is Susan Landau. I'm Hello, Susan, Susan Landau. Hi, I'm, but can you hear me fine? Yes, we can. Uh, I'm Susan Landau. I live at Hillcrest Place in Amherst. Um, I want to say that I have been tremendously appreciated, appreciative of the library in the 35 years I've lived in town. It was great for our children, the children's programs. It's great for me as an adult as I get towards retirement. It's terrific there. 
Um, I've been very disappointed by the delays that have been caused by people who opposed the extension, and I think we need to move forward forthwith. I hear Jeff's comments about uh, sustainability and so on, but the delays that we had originally in, in approving the plan uh, caused a, the, the project to be much more expensive. And so I just want to urge us to move forward as quickly as we can, because it's a, a, the changes in the library are something we need for our community and for the children and adults of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next, uh, we will have Janet Keller. Hello, Janet. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, Doug. We can Hello, hear you. Planning board members um, uh, and, and our consultants. Thank you all. And um, I have just a quick sentence or two. To me, the lifetime monetary costs and environmental costs of, of the decisions that are being made are critically important um, to both the environment um, impacts and the long-term impacts on um, our town's budgeting. And um, I'm thinking of things like the windows and the roofing. And I hope the decisions will be made in um, to effect um, long time environmental and um, monetary uh, results. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. All right, next uh, we have Ken Rosenthal. Thank Welcome. you. Thank Welcome, you, Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I ask the uh, architects to bring up the south facade, a drawing of the south facade? I just want to make one small point about a value engineering item that I think was left off that could save a little bit of money uh, based upon uh, something that should should be changed from the original drawings. If that's not possible, I'll just speak to it without it. Uh, Tony, is that a possibility? Let's see. Have we lost? I'm not Tony sure. seems to have this. Tony seems to have fallen dis off. Disappeared. Mr. Marshall, I'll I'll just speak to this because I think I can describe it. The um, just to the right of the front door on the front facade, the south facade. The original drawings called for a hole in the original wall to account for a book slot drop. And that was because there was originally a plan for an automated book sorting machine that was going to be multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars that is no longer part of the plan. It could come in later. But the slot through the, through the original stone wall, which will cost something to do and will deface the wall slightly, that still remains. I would like to say that that does not have to be done. It will save a little bit of money and it can always be done later if that automated book sorting machine comes in. Meanwhile, the uh, plans, the value engineer plans still contain the drop box at the end of the driveway on the east side of the building. And I, I would further like to say that if there is to be a book sorting machine close to a window, then the window can be adjusted so that a slot can be put through the bottom part of a window. A window can be made a little smaller and the stone facade of the building does not have to be defaced. Thank you for, I think, so that I, I think of the value engineering folks who put that in, that would save a tiny bit of money and move us a little bit along the way. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and, 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 and board for listening to me this evening. All right, thank you, Ken. Tony, that's a suggestion in case you're looking for additional items to save a little money on. Uh, Letitia LaFollette is next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. 
Letitia LaFollette, um, Dana Street in Amherst. Thank you very much for, um, for this presentation. This was really helpful. Um, I appreciate the value engineering um, that has gone into it. Um, and I also appreciate some of the positive suggestions that have been made. Um, I wanna reiterate what Neil Immerman and Susan Landa both said. This project has been delayed, 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 and delayed. It's really critical for the future of our town. So I would urge the planning board to, um, to move ahead as expeditiously as possible. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Letitia. Uh, next, we have Maria Kopicki. Thank you. Maria. Hello, Maria. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Doug. Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. Uh, I want to second uh, several things that have already been said. First, for the sustainability, Jeff is spot on. Um, I do appreciate um, Ms. Penta pointing out uh, very clearly that this is not a net zero building. It's not even close. Um, I do think it's um, extremely troubling that there's not even reports about uh, the impacts of these additional changes uh, on the energy efficiency of the building. And then to be going forward with that seems um, not right. Uh, the light monitor does help in, uh, in some ways. The efficient windows do help. The cross laminated timber, much was made of this. And there were a lot of hay made about that, um, about the embodied carbon. That is completely gone. So virtually all of the sustainability measures have been eliminated with these new plans. I wanna appreciate also Doug's comments that the whole point of this exercise of redesign and rebidding is to somehow bridge a $7 million gap, which is actually closer to 8 million by the time you add in escalation since we've got another year. Uh, another half year here. So the changes that have been proposed are nowhere in the vicinity of that num number, nowhere. Uh, and I think that what is being attempted here is to make a cheaper building a that that really does a disservice to the unique and historical nature of this building that we have. Um, the, re the change in shingles is unacceptable. Thank you, Design Review Board, and thank you for comments along those ways, along that those lines. Uh, and I just want to also point out that the Massachusetts Historic Commission has twice rejected the historic tax credits for this because the designs that have already gone through and that would still be in place violate five of the 10 standards that they have for those tax credits. So that's about $2 million that is gone. Uh, and really troubling about that is that that wasn't pointed out. We knew that in December, we knew it again in April. Well, we didn't know it. The public didn't know it. The town council didn't know it. The building committee didn't know it. The trustees probably didn't even know it, but Chair and Sherry did get those reports and that was not made public. This project is, it, 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 this is an exercise in futility and we're wasting time, money, energy um, on a project that should not move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. All right. Um, next, we have Martha Hanner. I'm Martha Hanner. I live on Alyssum Drive in South Amherst. Welcome. So thank you. Unfortunately, the current plan that's revised plan is no longer the project that Amherst residents voted for. As a resident and a voter, I feel betrayed. I do not agree that the essential integrity of the design has been preserved. In fact, I would call this a value subtraction. The costs of millions of dollars over the original budget, even with the proposed revisions, and the design is no longer the green building, sustainable building that was sold to voters. 
And uh, it's concerning the statements that historic portions are exempt from new energy codes means we don't have to try to do our best here. Uh, and that um, concerns me. Aspects of the historical building and woodwork are now proposed to be destroyed. So I urge the planning board to make the following requirements, to require the synthetic slate roof, both for durability and for the appearance of a historic building in our downtown, and that the original sustainable design, including the heating and cooling control and the new thermal efficient windows throughout the building, both the old and new sections be put part of the design. Uh, this is very important. I mean, we are in a climate crisis. If you look at the state of Massachusetts studies, you see that the heating, cooling, and sustaining of buildings is the second highest source of carbon dioxide emissions in Massachusetts, right following transportation, much higher than electricity generation. And we need a commitment to do as much as possible uh, and particularly in the case of the planning board here, to commit to making every new building and modification as sustainable and as close to net zero as possible uh, with no excuses. Uh, and also then I would propose that um, if solar panels are not being included on the roof now, that the planning board require that the design of the roof, the electrical systems, and any other design aspects needed for solar should be installed as part of this design so that later solar panels could be added without major impacts. I time also, is almost up. Yes. I, almost, I would just finally then urge the planning board to take a hard look again at the impacts on the historical museum next door, the structural ones, vibration, everything else that's going on. We need to treasure our historical library and carry okay. urgent repairs. So thank you. All right, thank you, Martha. All right, um, Shalini Mil Bal Milne, you are next. Hello, Shalini Bal Milne, District Five. Um, Welcome. Thank you. I'm speaking as a former town councilor, and I know firsthand how hard everyone has worked for over a decade um, on this, the library trustees, volunteers, town staff. So I just want to take a moment to appreciate all of you, the planning board, the staff, and you know, so much of our focus is everything that's going wrong. So I just want to take a moment to appreciate all the hard work and resilience of this group of people um, because that is what we do need right now. It is our responsibility to, within the resources that we have, with our commitment to the functions that this library is going to offer to the most vulnerable populations, to our youth, to the people who don't have alternatives, like many of us who are speaking today do have options and we don't, I mean, we are fine with the library, but there are people who really are relying on this additional functionality. So I hope we can all just stay focused on that and, and really work to get together uh, in that spirit, I really appreciate the questions that were asked by the planning board members today, by the design board. So I really do appreciate that all of us are working in that spirit to make sure that we get the library we want. Uh, there is, I would like some clarification because I keep hearing that, um, you know, some of the features have gone, I understand, with respect to sustainability, but my understanding is that uh, we're still eliminating the use of fossil fuels and becoming net zero ready. Am I right with that? And then the related question is then, if we stay with the existing building with just the repairs, will that be more sustainable? So where do we, which building is gonna be more sustainable given the changes that are being um, offered? All right, thank you, Shalini. Tony or Austin, do you want to comment on that at all or not? The, the, uh, Sharon, the proposed, the Sharon proposed, I see your hand. Maybe you want to jump in. Let, let me just say the following, Doug. The, 
the value engineered building will be much more sustainable than the library that we currently have under any scenario. Uh, it will be a dramatic, a dramatic improvement in terms of its energy efficiency under any scenario. So uh, that we that we that we know about the the current building is very energy inefficient. Sharon. All right, thank you. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to clarify some of the things that are, are, are being said. The building is going to be net zero ready, uh, meaning um, uh, once we purchase offsite renewables, uh, the building will be net zero. Um, and regarding the EUI, the re we don't. The reason we don't know it is because we can't run those reports until after the designs are done. So once all of these permitting meetings are complete, uh, then the architects will be able to finish uh, what they started, finish and, and bring us to some construction documents, and then they'll be able to run the, the reports, which will tell us what the EUI is. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. All right, um, two more two more public comments. Uh, one first from Tony Cunningham. Let's bring her over. Hi, thank you, Tony Cunningham, North Amherst. I just wanted to. Hello. Your audio has cut out. To an all electric system, and uh, fossil fuels could be removed. Are you able to hear me? Yes, you cut out for a minute and you're now back. Oh, sorry. I just stepped out because there's dishes noise in the background. Um, I just wanted to say that in a repair scenario, plan B, the HVAC system could be converted to electric. There is no requirement to go with the expansion plan in order to get rid of fossil fuels for this project. And in the estimates from 2020, um, the HVAC system and the roof could be done for around $2 million. So I think with escalation and um, some asbestos abatement, I could see a plan B achieving the high highest priority repairs for less than $5 million. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Tony. All right. Uh, we will, I believe, Arlie is next. Arlie, you'll have to give us your first and last name and your address in Amherst. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Arlie Gould, South Amherst. Um, this whole net zero and net zero ready and offshore off you know site purchases of um, clean energy and stuff. You know, one of the things going on, and this is a larger picture, but the true net zero building is producing its own energy. Purchasing off, you know, not on your own building it only came in because people couldn't afford to put solar panels on their roofs. There's a lot of old buildings in Massachusetts. So this community solar was developed for those reasons. The problem is, is like right now, Pure Sky is trying to cut down 6,000 trees off Shrewsbury Road to create these off-site, you know, things. Even though everybody has their separate domains and we're not supposed to talk about this or that at these different meetings, we live in one world, one town with interconnected issues. So, and the other thing is, off, you know, getting things off site, the grid is a, a long time from being clean. The, you know, the, the grid is largely fossil fuel driven still. The only way to get real clean energy is to be putting solar panels or whatever heat pumps it on your own building. So, you know, just in terms of climate and, and reducing impacts and stuff, it's it all looks good on paper and we can say net zero ready and off site and all this. But the reality of it is there's still a big difference between doing solar panels and versus purchasing off. You know, I, I'm in community solar because I can't put things on my roof. I would prefer to do that if I could. Um, anyway, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Arlie. 
Uh, next is Roman Handlin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Roman. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Roman. I live on Meadow Street in North Amherst. Um, I want to kind of echo something that was said by a, a different um, community member a few speakers ago about uh, serving the m most vulnerable populations. I mean, I think we all know that uh, at, at the end of the day, the library is a community space that a lot of us rely on. And I'm coming in speaking as someone who does rely on a lot of resources from the library. Um, and who is very low income and needs a lot that this amazing institution has to offer. Um, I really understand that this has been going on for a long time and that there's a lot of concerns about the changes in sustainability for cost purposes. However, I do want to say that if I was, as a voter in Amherst, if you propose this current proposal to me right now, I would still vote yes on it. Um, I'm really impressed by what the planning committee has been doing and all the hard work they've been doing to try to meet these updated costs and make changes that have to be made. And while I understand that I think a lot of us would love a, a true net zero right now, I do have faith in the net zero ready plan. And I also, as someone who is deeply dependent on the library, this has been going on for so long and I want to see the necessary changes happen now. And I think what's being proposed right now is extremely reasonable and still extremely valuable. And I think for me as a community member, my focus is on making this the best it can be for my future, for the for kids' futures, so that we can have this library uh, be sustainable as an institution and continue to exist because a lot of these things need immediate renovation and repair. and. What is being proposed now, I think, should happen and should happen soon. And there is opportunity for further work in the future. But I just want to come out and say that I am fully in favor of this. Um, and thank you so much to the, the planning committee and all the hard work you've been doing. So that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Roman. All right. I don't see any more hands raised. Uh, Wes's last call. Oh, we got a couple more. All right, uh, Tina Swift, you you are next. Hello, Tina. We we don't hear you yet. Oh, now, uh, just barely heard you there. Hi, I'm Tina Swift. I live in South Amherst, and I want to say I, too, would like to see this project go forward sooner rather than later. I spoke with a friend today who said, well, you know, that library was just recently renovated. And when I corrected her to say that that recent renovation was more than 30 years ago, she was surprised. Let's not go another 30 years. I also want to remind us all that if your car is broken, you go to a mechanic. You don't survey people around you who might drive a car, but don't know how to fix it. And this is what the trustees have done. They have hired Feingold Alexander and their contractors who are qualified. They do a good job. They have a good reputation. Let's listen to them. Thank you all for your hard work. Okay, thank you, Tina. All right, uh, Chris Benfrey, looks like you are probably the last comment this evening. Oh, hi, I'm Mickey Rathbun. I'm actually, <clears throat> Chris is my husband and I'm using his computer. Okay, uh, welcome. Thank you. I live at uh, 666 Southeast Street in South Amherst. Um, I have a background in historic preservation and it matters a great deal to me. I, I believe that an important part of Amherst's uh, core value is in its historic significance. Um, and it's <clears throat> unfortunate that the planners have paid very little interest to historic preservation 
uh, regarding this library. Uh, the Jones Library is his, you know, the centerpiece of the historic downtown uh, of, of Amherst. Um, I hope that everyone on this committee is familiar with the letters that have been sent by the uh, executive director of the Massachusetts Historical Commission, Brona Simon. Um, she expressed much concern about the adverse effects that this project is going to have on the building. Um, I see absolutely no indication that any of, of um, Brona Simon's concerns are being addressed by the planning board, even though I think that it's true that you know, the planning board is obligated to, uh, you know, give consideration to uh, historic preservation. Um, I think what is concerning to me at this point and, and evidence of how little uh, this planning process has taken into account historic preservation is the fact that um, a centerpiece of state and federal historic preservation legislation is uh, review under something called Section 106. This was meant to be a, under the guidelines, state and federal, Section 106 was meant to be commenced at the beginning of the planning process in order to get public input to bring in people that would consider the historic implications, the adverse effects, and come up with some, you know, compromise way forward. Um, the town has done nothing about Section 106 review. We don't even know at this point who is going to be the point person uh, it, conducting the review. Um, uh, you're you're project, getting close to the end of your time. I will finish. Thank you. Um, this project is going to be set out for bids again in about six weeks. We have no idea when the Section 106 process is going to take place. Um, the guidelines uh, that I know have been sent to various town officials make clear that this is a multi-step process. It takes months to... Um, Nikki, I think we need to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you for your attention. But um, okay. I, I do find the lack of, of awareness of historic, uh, the historic fabric of this town is, is just shocking to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that was our last hand raised for public comment. Uh, Sharon, I see your hand raised. Uh, yeah, Doug, and, thank, and thank you so much. If there's additional there. comments uh, in response to some of these public comments, whether it's Sharon or Austin, you wanna make now's the time to do that. No, actually uh, there's somebody uh, in the audience that's interested, but they're on their phone and they don't know how to raise their hand while on their phone. And so if one of you could tell them. Is this uh, the person at 413-230-9482? I'm guessing, Can do you guys know how to that how that person raises their hand? All right, well, Nate, so Nate will just bring them over and see if they can unmute themselves and speak. So if your number ends with 9482 uh, you, and you can figure out how to re unmute yourself, you are in a position to speak to us. Uh, if they if they unmute themselves, they can't speak. Is that? Yeah, I guess I guess uh, I I wouldn't know how to unmute myself on Zoom on mm -hmm. my phone. I don't know if anybody else would. Is this one of these Star Nine things? Yeah. Well, All right, well, I guess uh, 
I guess maybe we should ask that this person send in an email or a letter. It says star six. I don't know if that, you know, star six, that. is that what does it? They have their hand raised now, but I don't. Yeah, got their hand up. Uh, oh, now on hi, your... can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a lot of technical difficulties. I kept getting no sound during the, the Zoom. Um, Laura Drocker, 57 Rosemary Lane. Thank you for accommodating me on the phone. Um, I am a longtime supporter of the library project and I'm also, I also do not wanna see the town put more money into this project because I know we have several other projects that we need to accomplish. And so I really appreciate the willingness of the folks here to value engineer, to put this back out for bid, to try our hardest to get this project to move forward, because I do think this is the most cost-effective way for us to achieve all the goals of this project and the other projects that the town needs to complete within our fiscal availability. Um, I So thank you. Um, I'm a longtime member of the Amherst Energy and Climate Committee. I have dedicated my career to climate activism and life cycle assessment. I've been really disheartened throughout this debate, if you want to call it that, of the weaponizing of sustainability. At first, it was not sustainable enough, so we should not do it. Now, it's not sustainable enough in a different way, so we should not do it. I think um, the most important thing to address the climate crisis is to stop burning fossil fuels. And we have an opportunity with this building to not only meet our community needs, but to get a very large source of fossil fuel use in our town off fossil fuels. Um, I also believe that this building is solar ready. I think there's many federal and state incentives that is gonna, are gonna make that easy to do in the short term, and that's gonna help us save money and make this a net zero building. So um, just thank you for your work and thank you for figuring out how to let me talk. Okay. All right, thank you, Laura. All right, so I don't see any more hands and unless somebody else has heard of someone else that is trying to raise their hand, uh, I guess we'll, we'll move on. All right. Um, I guess uh, panelists will come back to you guys, to us and uh, board members. Is, are there any uh, further questions or comments? Um, I guess one comment that that came to mind while I heard about heard these comments, um, I would think that if we did want to put solar panels on this building, on the uh, upper portion of the gambrel, uh, Bruce. Um, that at the time we were buying the panels, we could replace the, the uh, asphalt shingles. Um, so I don't, you know, I think this is, an, this is a revocable uh, act. Uh, it's not irrevocable. Um, you know, at, at any point in the future, somebody could come back and replace that roofing with, you know, ribbed metal panels that can support solar panels or uh, or the synthetic slate or real slate, whatever. Um, and I provoked uh, Bruce enough to raise his hand. Go ahead. Uh, Doug, I think you're not wrong about that. It's <laughs> just that uh, it's probably then we're talking about whether we do the whole roof or not. I, uh, you're right that it's it often isn't done. People just plonk them on and they don't think. But hopefully we will be thoughtful enough and hopefully Chris Riddle will keep telling his story around town and eventually we'll realize that uh, the two uh, systems have to have equivalent lifespan. Right. Do you want to do an eight o'clock uh, toilet break? Oh, sure. I, this is, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. All right. Um, why don't we take a five minute break? And it looks like the, the time is 8.12. We'll come back at 8.17 and continue with board discussion and uh, maybe be able to wrap this up this evening. Uh, when you come back, turn on your video and unmute yourself.
All right, time is 8.17 and looks like people are returning. Okay, uh, Chris, I see your hand. The time is 8.18. Why don't we resume our meeting? So I would like to ask Nate if there's anything about the um, Historic Commission um, review and recommendations that might have an influence on the planning board, or should the planning board just go ahead and vote tonight based on what they have heard? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Nate Malloy. The Historical Commission had uh, scheduled a hearing for tomorrow night. It wasn't posted correctly, so it's postponed until the 22nd. So, you know, we'll still get on Zoom tomorrow and let everyone know. But um, the Historical Commission is looking at the project from the demolition bylaw and the historic preservation restriction. Uh, I think from the uh, demolition bylaw, you know, it's because there's been some changes to what's being proposed. I think it's pretty minor. Um, in terms of the preservation restriction, the commission can look at any changes. Um, it's considered, you know, major alteration. So the change in roof, the changing in the landscape, um, the, you know, courtyard, um, you know, really it's, again, kind of changes from the proposed, you know, from what were the um, approved plans to now. And so, I, I mean, I don't, I think the planning board can go ahead and make their their decision. The historical commissions um, will make theirs, and so you know, if at some point they need to be reconciled, they can. I don't, you know, for instance, if the planning board said everything looks great and the commission says no, then well, they have you know, they have to do what the commission says because the preservation restriction is binding on the property. If the planning board really likes something and the historical commission has an opinion, then you know we can have that discussion. But I, I think the planning board can go ahead and. You know, with this review now, they don't have to wait for the historical commission. Okay. All right. Um, so, board members, I guess I'm. I guess I'd like to find out whether you're generally uh, supportive of what we've seen tonight, and if so, whether you'd support us going through the whatever findings and conditions we need to modify to proceed with an approval of this site plan review. So um, uh, Bruce, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Um, I guess, uh, whereas, as you said, this is a uh, site plan review is not something that we would expect to deny or to, uh, it's a, a conditional approval that typically we uh, proceed with. and. Um, I had uh, my three questions had to do with areas where I thought I, I might be interested in proposing uh, conditions uh, subject to approval. Um, and only uh, one of those now do I think I would uh, wish to pers uh, pursue. And that is the uh, the condition that the, uh, the roof... Uh, uh, retain its uh, synthetic slate. Um, I could be argued out of that. I think, Doug, by the uh, observation that you made, and uh, and and perhaps if that really is going to be a significant uh, cost impediment, uh, um, and I was in a minority of one, um, I probably would uh, vote uh, for unanimity. But uh, I would like us to consider that as a as a condition. I think we are. Uh, maybe I should can. Uh, confirm that, uh, I mean, of course, you never know what uh, an applicant might not uh, take to uh, test out in uh, in the Massachusetts court or something. But short of that, I think it's uh, typical and reasonable for this board to impose conditions on its mm -hmm. uh, approval. And uh, um, 
Uh, so I think I'm uh, of a mind uh, having th thought about this a fair bit because we've already been through this once some a uh, couple of months ago, and then we had a fairly comprehensive uh, set of documents that was submitted that uh, that we were able to review, and then we've discussed it and heard uh, public comment and so forth. And at this point, I I think that um, uh, no matter what I may think about this project in relation to other town building projects that are in the, in the mix and whether it's in the right order or not, this is the, uh, the one that is before us. And, uh, I think I'm ready to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to propose a conditional approval, um, based on what I just said. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Jesse. Yeah, just, uh, comment, I guess I would also lean that way along with Bruce, that the only thing I would think about suggesting would be staying with the, the uh, <clears throat> synthetic slate. Other, other issues, other changes I had no concern about. Short term. Okay. Thanks. Karen? Well, um, just like my decision with the design review board where we all felt that we would not approve the asphalt roof. And I, I think when we asked about costs, the cost savings of that was around $250,000, which in the scheme of all these millions is a lot, but it's not going to make or break the building. And I think it is extremely important. So I would agree. I would keep that as a decision. And I do think that we have what what Mickey Rathbone said about from the beginning, we just didn't perhaps um, make it clear to the architects that the historic preservation was extremely important. The fact that we have gotten turned down for these two million is it's it's a bummer. It should have been something that was considered really strongly in the beginning, and uh, I feel badly about that. But I do think that at least we can hang on to the roof because that is a big thing in the appearance and in just the ambiance of what this library presents as the centerpiece of our town. All right. Uh, well, it sounds like I'm a minority of one uh, in that, you know, I'm not excited about asphalt, but I, as I said earlier, I don't think it's a irrevocable act. And, um, you know, I, I guess the way they have the bid uh, structured at the moment with the uh, art, the uh, synthetic slate being the base bid means to me that the preference is that they do that. And if there's money available, they'll do it. Um, and I'd rather, you know, have to backslide to the asphalt if there isn't money available. Uh, then see the project stop. Um, so that's where I stand. Um, so does anybody want to make a motion? And um, since we're going to need to vote one way or the other on this this evening, I suppose we could uh, continue the meeting if we wanted to hear from the Historic Commission. But it sounds like from Nate's point of view, um, you know, they can make their decision and we can make ours. Uh, Bruce, before I call on you, I see your hand. Uh, Christine has raised her hand. Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to mention something that we talked about before the meeting started. And that is that um, with a quorum of four members, um, you need a majority of the four members to vote one way or another. So you don't need all four of you because it's a site plan review. So um, that was changed a few years ago in the zoning bylaw. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. Okay, thank you. Bruce. Doug, I think I will make a motion to approve the applicants uh, subject to the condition that I mentioned. Uh, I would say that uh, I agree with you uh, whilst I agree with you, as I said earlier, it's also possible that in the in the event that uh, that, that that the synthetic slate was a make or break, that the applicant could come back and uh, ask for uh, forgiveness, and uh, with that particular um, notion on the table, uh, I think I'd uh, I'd change my mind. But I'd like to go in with the requirement and see whether. 
we can't make it happen rather than go in with the applicant having the, de the decision making about this particular item. So that would be my motion. And, and if I may, I, I should perhaps say that just from my experience uh, professionally over the years with historic preservation and so forth, uh, I've noted in the papers and other, in other uh, uh, articles that I've seen that the word violate has been used in relation to the secretary's standards. And I really don't think that's fair. We, I don't know. I haven't sat in on these uh, building committee deliberations, but I do know from my own per personal project experience with historic tax credits and dealings with the uh, secretaries and standards and so forth, that uh, it becomes a design uh, development decision. It may well be, and I don't know it, but it may well be that the cost of complying with the secretary's standards to get that two million uh, would cost the project more than two million, in which case the uh, logical, uh, perhaps not uh, celebrated uh, for historic preservation points of view, but a logical economic decision would be to proceed to, with not uh, pursuing the historic tax credit. So I don't think we can conclude that this is a violation of standards or of integrity or of interest or any of that sort. I don't know, but I'm certainly not prepared to conclude that the uh, committee has uh, acted um, in ignorance, uh, stupidity, disregard, or any of that sort of thing, simply because the uh, Massachusetts Historic Commission denied the uh, application. But anyway, my motion is made. Uh, right. And I don't know about well, how we, we want to go. We're probably going to need to go through some of the findings and conditions. Uh, I assume so. I wasn't quite sure how that mechanism was yeah. going to work. So but what, I, I thought I would we... start with the uh, essence of the uh, of the motion. Okay. So why don't we hold on your motion? Let's not do a second until Chris. Uh... Chris, you are muted. There you I go. I did look through the findings before, and I don't particularly think that you need to go through that list of findings again. I think that there's nothing in this list of findings that would be altered by what you're doing tonight. I mean, All right. so it's fine the, if you do. So, the, so I think as part of the motion, we ought to be uh, uh, affirming the findings as previously approved on whatever date it was. And I would say specifically in relation to the drainage, because that's the big uh, change really from our point of view. With regard to the drainage? Yeah. Yes, I think it, I think it would be appropriate for us to, uh, to ratify specifically the finding on the, on the drainage. Uh, sufficiency of the drainage uh, solution or saltwater management solution, I guess we should say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't see in my run through of these findings that there was anything that would be violated if you go along with the changes that are being proposed tonight. So I don't, I don't think you need to go through the findings. Um, so Doug said, affirming the findings as previously approved and Bruce is saying, um, especially with regard to drainage, that you find that the, the drainage stormwater is, management stormwater management is uh, satisfactory. Yeah. Okay. So that's findings and conditions. Um, Bruce mentioned one condition. Mr. Uh, Colder mentioned one condition having to do with the roof. Um, there were two conditions that I thought you might want to reword or say something new about. Um, and the first condition, I'm referring to the site plan review document um, that you uh, approved last winter. So the first condition is the project shall be built substantially in accordance with documents submit submitted to the planning board and approved on December 6th, 2023. Um, as, mod as modified, as modified by the as documents modified. submitted to tonight's meeting? Yeah. Submitted and approved on what is tonight? July 31st. July 31st. Okay. And then there's another one. Um, condition four, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan. Um, so I would again say 
um, as modified yeah, by modified. the plans yep. that are submitted. And then it sounds like there's at least Bruce's motion is going to be to require the use of uh, synthetic slate on the original building. That would be a condition, a new condition. I believe right. so. Is yes. that correct? I, I might re with it is to require the retention of the use of synthetic slate because it's already there. In the design or on the building? In the design for the new building. Mm -hmm. Or for the repair for the of the old, old building. The existing building. Okay, I think I've got that. So that's part of the motion. Do you want me to read it again? Yeah. Um, Bruce's motion is to approve um, the project subject to the condition that, um, well, now we're wording it to say, uh, that would require the retention of the use of synthetic slate for repair of the existing building. And then um, that condition one of the site plan review from 2024-02 would be, um, the project shall be built substantially in accordance with documents submitted to the planning board and approved on December 6th as modified by documents submitted and approved on July 31st, 2024. And then Condition four of that same uh, decision, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan as modified by plans submitted and approved on July 31st. And then yeah. there's some more wording after that, but I think that can just stay as it is. Oh, yeah. And also the, the reference to the findings, that should be folded in there too, shouldn't it? And, and you affirm the findings as previously approved especially with regard to stormwater management and you find the stormwater management to be satisfactory. Right. Correct. So that's my new motion. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to ask uh, Austin and Sharon, um, do you have, do you want to express any objections to this before we move forward? Um, from my perspective, it actually doesn't change your plans. Your plan is to proceed, have as part of the base bid, the synthetic slate, and um, I would, I hope you will keep the alternate, uh, the deduct alternate for the asphalt shingles in your uh, project documents, and uh, if you need to make use of that alternate, uh, we're going to need you to come back. I think I think I think that's fine, Doug. Okay, great. Uh, in case, in that case, Bruce, I will second your motion. All right, um, uh, Jesse, Karen, Bruce, any further comments before we go ahead and vote on these? Okay. All right. So. Um, do we, do we need Chris to re read the motion or shall we just uh, vote? If you say yes, you are voting in favor of Bruce's motion as recorded by Chris. If you say no, you are opposing it. All right, uh, starting with you, Bruce. I'm an aye. All right, Jesse. Aye. Karen. Aye. All right, and I will vote aye as well. So that's four in favor, three members absent. The vote is in favor of the motion. Um, Austin, Sharon, and the design team, um, you have your site plan approval. You may proceed to whatever the next step is. It sounds like it's historical commission. Um, we wish you the best, and we hope you have the money to put on the synthetic slate. Thank you again. Thank you to the members of the planning board. Thank you for your care and going through the project, and thank you for the approval. We really appreciate the work that you do and the service that you provide to the town. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you all on the design team for giving up an evening.
Thank you for your time as well. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Okay, the time is 837. We will move on to the next items on the agenda. And let's see. Chris, old business, topics not reasonably anticipated. I don't have any old business. Actually, hold on a minute. Um, we need to vote to close the hearing, right? That's right. Yep. All right. Um, so moved. Okay. Seconded to vote to close the hearing. Um, going to any comments before we vote? All right. Bruce? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Karen? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Close. The hearing is closed. All right, now we can move on. Chris, any other old business? I don't have any old business. How about unanticipated new business? Nope. Form A, A and R subdivision? You have one that's coming up, but it's not ready to bring to you yet. Okay. None tonight. None tonight. How about upcoming ZBA applications we might want to know about? Um, the Wayfinders has submitted their application for Belchertown Road and East Street School Affordable Housing Development, so we'll probably be bringing that back to you. They've made substantial changes in the architecture, a lot of them based on comments that you um, gave them, so I think you'll be pleased with the um, new proposal. Um, and we have also received other applications, but I don't think I need to list them tonight since you'll be meeting again next Wednesday. Right. Okay. Yeah, quickly on the wayfinders. It's a, you know, the hearing is an expedited process as a comprehensive permit. So we have to have the transmittal out within a week from uh, today. So you'll be getting that. And then the hearings opening on August 29th. And the it's expected it'll take a few months to get through. Um, so if the planning board doesn't have a chance to comment on it before the opening hearing, um, all the documents are, are probably already online and available to see under the ZBA's webpage. And then we can schedule a time, you know, in September or October for the planning board to look at the project. Okay. Upcoming SVP, SBR, SUB applications. Yes, we did get a preliminary subdivision plan application um, for the Shootsbury Road property that is the subject of the solar um, proposal. So uh, that is uh, an intention to freeze the zoning on that pro uh, property. So I think we'll be bringing that to you on September 4th. Um, you need to make a decision um, within 45 days. Um, so we'll be bringing that to you. Okay. All right, committee and, committee and liaison reports. Bruce, PVPC, anything we wanna to say tonight versus next week when there might be more people? Nothing to report uh, and no anticipation of anything for next week uh, either, actually. Okay. CPAC, uh, we did have a meeting where the track and field project at the high school was brought back uh, with a request for an additional $800,000 of CPAC funding for that project. We did, uh, we did approve that amount as the, you know, I mean, it's a not to exceed, um, but we encouraged town council to look carefully at the scope. Uh, it seemed like there were some things that could come out and be deferred. Um, and that uh, the regional school committee uh, connect with the other towns and make sure that those, the, the asks of their Community Preservation Act committees also happens. So that meeting was last night, and I don't know, I don't remember when the next meeting will be happening. We will get into our regular annual cycle this fall. Um, and Karen, Design Review Board, anything else other than the library project? No, it was the library project that we discussed, and I think you're all familiar with um, what we decided, and it was very much in the same way at the planning board we were we were also not very happy about the windows but um mainly we 
just said that we could not approve the roof and the rest of the landscaping, none of it made us happy, of course, but um, we thought that that was something that could be changed in the future. Okay. And Chris, anything on CRC? Um, the CRC continues to review the solar bylaw and they're meeting on Tuesday of this coming week and they're going to be um, make, came, coming up with a list of questions uh, for bringing the solar bylaw to various boards and committees and town staff people. Um, questions to ask you about what's in the bylaw right now and what you'd like to keep and how you might like to change it. So that's what they're doing. Okay. All right, uh, report of chair. Um, I guess my only uh, item to mention is that I will not be present at next week's meeting. Uh, I might be able to call in from the road, uh, but uh, we'll probably ask Johanna to mo moderate the meeting. Um, and Chris, we were going to try to, well, we still need to get a, a new member, right? Um, when is town council scheduled to do that? I think they're meeting on August 5th. Um, and oh, So Monday. I believe that they're going to um, attend to that uh, question on Monday. Yep. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Uh, that's all I had. Um, Bruce, you raised your hand for a second there. Did you want to say something? Just wanted to ask the same question that you asked. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Chris, report of staff. I don't have any report right now. I wanted to thank Nate for um, taking over and running the meeting tonight and also to say how much I miss Pam when she's not here because it's hard to remember to do everything that she does. So that's all. Okay. All right. Uh, time is 844. If no one objects, we can adjourn. Thank you all and uh, have a good meeting next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you.